10 15. So it was 10 to 11 15. So <clears throat> cool. Glad to everybody here. Really, really, really high property tax. Uh, and sales taxes and marginal state income tax and but that's in California talking I'm sure all right so this is a super great topic uh, no question about that and I asked every speaker to actually give me uh, a question for the group as a whole but I think considering our topic focus around YouTube and monetization and uh, I think it's actually a really interesting time to talk about the future of YouTube I don't know that we'll need too many of the questions coming from the uh, from the panelists themselves because I'd love to focus on questions from you guys I had to finish getting dressed up before I do anything else. Okay, I've now buttoned everything to the best of my knowledge. Okay, um, first I'm going to ask every panelist to introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Mike Borhouse. Some of you know me. Uh, I'm the president of Magnet Advisors. We're a media research and consulting firm. Um, I'm pro media uh, of all forms, old and new. And why don't you go ahead and start, and then we'll uh, have everybody give us about one minute on themselves, maybe a tiny bit on their company, and then. We'll start with questions to the audience right away, unless uh, unless we don't have any, in which case we are well armed. Great. Um, my name is Kai Hassan. I'm the co-founder and creative director of Portal A. Uh, we founded in we founded in 2008. We are a digital studio that makes branded content for the web. Um, some of our bigger clients are YouTube, Microsoft, um, Benefit Cosmetics. Um, Recently, we've been known for making uh, YouTube's year-end rewind video, which over the last uh, three years has gotten about 400 million views. Uh, we also make, uh, thank you, we also make uh, original content. Uh, we made a web series uh, called White Collar Brawler, and then went to TV, just finished its second season on Esquire Network, uh, and we're going to be announcing some new original shows soon. So that's, that's me. Cool. Hello all, uh, happy Monday. Chris Younger here with Eisenberg Group, one of the principals at the agency. We're up in Pasadena, about 120 folks. Um, as an agency, we've spent probably the last four years dealing with calls from brands, much kind of what you mentioned about how to manage influencers, how to take advantage of social, what's going on in the mobile space. So with that, we've spent the last three investing in building out a tech platform to help manage influencers on behalf of brands, uh, working a lot with MCNs, working a lot with ad networks to try to help integrate brand performance with influencers along with the overall creative strategy that has to do with brand strategy for the clients we work with. Our clients include folks like Microsoft, Yahoo, Marriott, Mattel uh, are some of the key clients we deal with on every day. Thanks. Uh, my name is Adam Westcott. I run a company called Select Management Group. Uh, we manage top YouTube talent, like My Life is Ava, Lord DIY, and Gigi Gorgeous. So we take care of all of the brand integrations, working directly with uh, MCNs and then direct to agencies. And then on the other side, we have Select Next, which is more of an incubator for original production and uh, licensing, merchandising, touring, publishing, business development. Uh, my name is Tony Chen, I founded a company called Channel Factory, um, founded it actually four, four or five years ago back in, uh, back in college, so college dropout, was a piano major. Um, so basically, um, yeah, no relation, huh? Uh, so basically, Channel Factory is a YouTube and native video marketing platform, so we're a technology company uh, working very closely with a lot of brand advertisers and mainly media agencies, helping them deploy media very efficiently on YouTube and social video. Uh, doing influencer activations, and also uh, we're starting to get in the branded content space too. So yeah. I definitely want to talk to Tony now after this. <laughs> uh, my name is Rebecca Donahue. I'm the director of digital content and social media for Vin DeBona Productions. We're best known for making America's Funniest Home Videos and have been since 1989 when I was about 12. Um, <laughs> It's, I'm also in charge of running the digital creative for all of our extensions, uh, America's Funniest Animals, America's Funniest Kid, and some properties that we incubate on digital and then try to sell to television. Most recently, we just sold a product called Memory Hole, which is everything that doesn't make it onto America's Funniest Home videos, all the creepy videos that we get sent, made into a new property. So look out for that on Adult Swim. But, but not all of them. Not all. Thank God. <laughs> Uh, Kudor News, full screen. Full screen's a traditionally a multi channel network that's uh, since evolved into more of a global media company. 
we're really focused on developing social media content creators and uh, producing content with them and brands and bring them together for uh, quality integrations. Excellent. Okay. Well, like I said, not going to be hard to have a lot to talk about here. Uh, who does have questions? Let me see who came here armed with questions. Uh, you know, it's, oh, yeah, you see, that's more, that is more than the normal. Okay. So you hesitate for one second. So I'm going to go with what I thought, just we'll start with one of the panel's questions, which I thought was, um, oh, Chris, it's yours. I was about to compliment you in a huge way. Fabulous. Thanks, Chris Mike. and I are friends. <laughs> and Chris is a good guy. And I thought, Chris, I thought you just literally said it perfectly. I couldn't, I couldn't have edited it in any way, shape, or form. And it's a perfect launch question for the panel. Uh, why is YouTube such a powerful platform for programming, for content, and for advertising? What does it do well? Where does it fall short? This, I think, deserves everyone on the panel to speak to kind of the pros and cons of YouTube today. Otherwise, we may try to just do three or four at every other question. YouTube today, pros, cons, where are they nailing it? Where are they shooting themselves in the head? All right, I'll start. Um... Why is it so powerful? I mean, the, the you can you could probably rattle off twenty different things that makes YouTube special. But number one, and for the clients that we work with and the brands, um, you know, you're looking at audience. So if you look at um, the type of person who's on YouTube, it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific age. Although there is an age younger that um, is generally found on YouTube, uh, it's a type of person um, who grew up with. Um, a phone in their hand, we grew up in front of a computer. If you want to hit that core demo, you want to talk to them in an authentic way, and you want to make an impression on them, you have to hit them where they're enjoying their content, and that, that is YouTube. Um, it just is. Uh, and so the brands that come to us, they're looking to um, sort of tap into the voice that works on YouTube. And, and you know, I think a lot of people will tell you that there's something, some specific voice. Uh, I don't think there necessarily is, but I do think that there are certain voices that don't work on YouTube uh, and that sort of get called out very quickly. Um, and so, again, what's special is that group, uh, that, vo uh, that demographic, and then our job or my job, the challenge is how do you make good content that gets a brand's message across but is in the language of YouTube? Bravo. The... Um... I guess it's my question. I should have a good answer. Um, the, uh, so when, I'm, when we're looking at YouTube and we're looking at the clients that are calling us about how to manage this platform, you look from the good side, which is a, probably the key stat, right? It's the number two search engine out there for a lot of our clients. So if your brand is being searched on this platform, then what is the impression? What is the opinion? What is being driven from this platform? And kind of put Facebook and Twitter and a lot of other social yeah. platforms into the same bucket about the discoverability of your brand and the overall ecosystem of a brand. So the downside or challenge we have is, I don't know about any of you, when you go look for your brand, what is it sandwiched between? What's the story is being told and arc between other content out there? So the platform is very open-ended, very challenging. So for us as a, as a partner with the brands we work with, Yes, the platform's fantastic is what it represents, whether I'm working with Mattel or working with Marriott, two completely different cultures about how they want their brand perceived. And then how do you actually manage that, that story arc there? So the content creating and the journey that's going on, my last note is as an agency six or seven years ago, paid media dictated what we made. So we're gonna do a TV spot, we're gonna do a print, we're gonna do banner, we're gonna do out of home, whatever it is would come over to the agency and be like, now make these things because paid media justified it. That's no longer the case. Now the relationship of the audience is dictating what content we want to make. And we're able to put it out there in the wild. And then we follow up with media to determine whether it's worthy to be amplified. So curating, managing, developing content, much like you said, um, is really critical. So the dynamics have shifted 180 about how our brands and our clients work with platforms such as YouTube. But it does require um, it does require a lot of management side, at least for us and, and, the, and the business we're working on to keep it all integrated because it's an ongoing relationship day in and day out. Uh, I would just add from a talent perspective that the power of YouTube is really supporting independent creators. So you have the luxury of creating content from scratch. And also of all the social platforms out there, it's one of the only ones that provides a foundation of revenue through ad set. So as an independent creator, you could be earning from, from day one Whereas on Vine and Twitter, it's mostly brand integrations and sponsored opportunities after the fact. Um, I would say one of the 
obstacles to overcome is probably just discovery because it is a saturated marketplace of content. There's so much out there, but YouTube is now helping really surface uh, independent creators through their preferred program, which is the top 5% of talent. And you've seen more and more billboards on sunset, commercials and marketing campaigns called the beacon program that help support the top creators, because then you'll see the trickle down. If, if uh, the mass audience starts to understand the content that's out there through those creators, they'll discover the creators beneath them. So Adam, I just want to follow up on this. So YouTube, I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing you say YouTube is pro talent, talent likes YouTube. Well, the, it's, it's been an evolution because I actually created and ran one of the funded channels in 2012. And that was, okay, let's create more premium content that can compete with cable or, you know, stand out outside of the babies and the dogs and the cats on YouTube. And it didn't do well, 120 channels, where are they now? Um, and so now they've really doubled down on the creators. It's okay, there are 5%, let's focus on the 5% of the top YouTubers that have gained audience. We know are creating content on a regular basis, following best practices, and let's connect them with advertisers. So now more than ever, you see Bethany Moda, Tyler Oakley, Grace Helbig, who are really crossing over into mainstream. But I think for our talent, um, it's always important to remain loyal to your foundation. I mean, YouTube is the core of what they do. That's where their audience exists. So whether they move to TV or or publishing, whatever else they're working on, it's always engaging and keeping active where you started on YouTube. So that's a, mostly a positive. Yes, okay. very positive <laughs> for, for our talent. <laughs> Excellent, go ahead. Um, so a few really good stuff. One is um, YouTube is becoming less of a branding mechanism, but more of a performance. So um, right now, mobile is huge, right? Most of the traffic's coming from mobile, and YouTube is uh, uh, basically allowing a lot of advertisers to put in you know, very, very cool direct uh, uh, call to action units that allows for direct response type of campaigns. So that's one that's really good too, is uh, you know, because YouTube has like ridiculous reach from over 70 countries, um, you know, one of our actually biggest growth areas that I see is uh, um, we're growing a lot with like China advertisers looking to expand outside of China. Um, that's really interesting. And I forgot my third one, but anyways, the bad stuff about YouTube is that uh, from a media buying and implementation, the data they're able to kind of uh, connect YouTube with is really bad because like YouTube doesn't allow you to connect uh, a lot of your audience data that you deploy pretty much all of your media with off YouTube with your YouTube. So you're pretty much segmenting your media buy to like YouTube land and then off YouTube land. And that's on purpose, correct? That's a, yeah, a rule yeah. they've made. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a smart strategy. It's like, dude, spend it all with me, you know? And uh, I mean, that's, that's the strategy that they implement. Um, yeah, oh, actually, the third really good stuff actually about YouTube. By the way, that gets a lot worse when you get older. Huh? It gets a lot worse than memory. Thing Forgetting older. number three. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so the number three thing that's really, that's really good is YouTube is really great for incubating content. Um, so like if you want to test out like a pilot or something, you combine that with really targeted media, um, you get to see some really awesome results that you just, you know, like if you want to pilot a TV show, it costs like six mil. Excellent. Yeah, a lot of people have touched upon it here, but I would say the pros are definitely, it's where the eyeballs are. They've definitely figured out the monetization piece, though we could argue whether that monetization piece is actually good for creators and copyright holders. Um, but they've definitely figured that out. And I would agree with Adam. And I would say, to me, what's lacking right now is, is discovery. I think it's just because it's so overwhelming for the platform itself. I, I really like the simplicity of Vine's discovery feature in terms of finding new talent, it's just really simple and clear. Yeah, I think everyone's got a lot of really great points up here. I would also add, uh, from a brand perspective, I think it's been interesting how YouTube has really forced brands to think about their their brand differently and how they're reaching their audiences. Uh, it's forced an entirely new creative class of content creators and uh, advertisers. And so now brands, due to the authenticity and due to the fact that uh, it's such a community-driven platform, uh, you, you really can't try to hide something or, or fake your brand or sneak it into anybody's content anyway. It's, it's forcing them to be a little more genuine, much more creative, and uh, more honest with their consumers. I'm, ju I'm just curious. I know you're not all buyers per se, but you're all 
close to buyers and whatnot, putting on your ad buyer hat for a second, because I think uh, the gentleman from Channel Factory made an interesting point. Would you, would any of, would you buy 100% of your online video inventory, say a broad demographic, 1834 male, female, would you buy it all on YouTube? 90% on YouTube, 80% on YouTube, 70, 60? I mean, it really depends on who you are. Yeah, yeah but I'm just trying to get a sense of, 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 from your perspective, if you were buyers, knowing all the buyers you know, what, what kind of a percent of buy you think they tend to get? Like I said, 1834. Specifically for media, you mean? Uh, if, yes, for selling yeah. media, yes. Um, I would buy CPM, 70% CPA, YouTube targeted and focused and then go to uh, related brands and sites that complement that. Buzzfeed. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. A lot of clients want to um, want to do something for the sole purpose of gaining a presence on YouTube, right? So the, um, the goal isn't necessarily at the moment to sell their product or you know, other other objectives. It's simply we want to get into the YouTube game and we want to build a subscriber base or we want to whatever. In those cases, yeah, the vast, vast majority of your buy is going to be right on YouTube. Okay. Yes, please. You're asking me. <laughs> we were staring at me. Uh, I think YouTube has, like I said earlier, YouTube's uh, become better about really supporting creators. So definitely Bethany was put on a track, but she's very good at what she does and had the it factor. I mean, there's a reason she can do Dancing with the Stars and, and continue to grow her following. Um, so it's a little bit of that it factor that you would find with any talent in, on any medium. Uh, our our client Ava Gatowski is now the face of Invisalign, Sperry's Topsiders, um, and we just did an original music video that she wrote and produced herself. And she, I compare it to Zendaya of YouTube. I mean, she's just a performer. It doesn't matter what platform she's on. And now YouTube is really recognizing that because they see her exponential growth rate and and her engaged audience, and they're saying, okay, let's find ways to help showcase her, whether it's on. Um, YouTube's marketing platforms, even even as simple as YouTube's Twitter and Instagram accounts. So they posted a photo of Ava. It did 2,000 more likes than uh, Obama on the YouTube uh, Instagram feed. So it just shows that their audience is highly engaged. And I think once, although yes, there are many, many, many creators out there, they start to surface just because of their growth rate, because of their talent, because of their potential and working with other people, whether it's an MCN, a manager, um, publicist even at this point. So, are there, How many undiscovered people are there out there? I mean, I mean there, have you been discovered yet? There's, there's, <laughs> there, <laughs> well, Mike, there's over, there's over 400,000 <laughs> in, in the ecosystem, a content creators. 400,000 people making some money. A tiny making money something on YouTube. Now, whether they're all making, <laughs> not as many are making money. But there's a ton of content. So the the and how many new people a year from now? On top of that, <laughs> well, that's what I think. That's where like we don't know because there's always emerging talent. Okay. Um, Ava specifically, she grew overnight. To, I mean, two years, and she's over 2.3 million now. Whereas some of the top legacy creators, like a Shane Dawson and Phil DeFranco, they've been doing this for six plus years at this point. So they're more the legacy players, but we never know who the talent of tomorrow will be. And by the way, I think the staying power is a really important point because I think a lot of people five years ago, six years ago would have said, I don't know, that person will be nowhere in a year. In fact, I know a senior YouTube executive who told me when Bieber was just starting to break out and I said, you know, he started on YouTube and she goes, my daughter says he'll be nobody in a year. I won't name who it is because like half the, <laughs> half the room knows this person. Well, then you've got another Bieber in Sean Mendez who came out of Vine. So there'll always be that next generation of talent and they may come out of YouTube. They may come out of whatever the next social platform is. I mean, Snapchat right now, some of our talent are doing 100,000 plus uh, views on Snapchat. So we haven't monetized it necessarily yet, but, you know, there's limited metrics, but we can see there's an audience there. I'm sorry, Chris, you were going to say something about celebrities. No, I just think there's the influencer component, but then there's a YouTube as a whole platform. So influencer is a component of how a brand from a brand perspective is told. So, you know, the team at plan a here does a ton of content. 
influencer may not be associated with it at all, but that medium provided a way of doing long form content that's not constrained by a 30 second ad platform. It's long form engagement. So the other point Tony was making was around amplification. So uh, the question around what works or doesn't work, what's great is it's how you use the media dollars on the platform to determine which to drive discovery against. Uh, you're absolutely, it will get lost if just put out there. So you have to have dollars reserved to understand how the content works, test it, drive engagement, and move th through through that ecosystem. My only last point too on, on the influencer side is we've been buying for years and these talent, you can get them early and often is great, but one at one point it might be 10,000 for a, an engagement, 50,000 per engagement, 100,000 per engagement, right? To Buskis or CNNers or, you know, QDPI, right? Gets PewDiePie gets mentioned all the time in every brief. So it, your, your job is to also figure out how to do an ecosystem that has the tier one high value and two and three and four and groom that and build that over time because brands are looking for ongoing relationships. And so YouTube and the biggest thing influencers talk about is authenticity. So if you want to be authentic, then you, it better be over a long period of time, not just here in a moment. And so that's another makeup of the YouTube platform, understanding how these audiences work. They're just... Um, you know, it's just, it just have to think of that as a long-term relationship. Well, and to support that, and then I'll be quiet. No, no, this, I think it's an interesting topic. This year, more than ever, we saw brand, and it's, it's starting to evolve, obviously. This year, more than ever, we saw brands investing longer term rather than one-off trials. So several several of our talent have P&G retainers for the year where they're doing multiple campaigns throughout the year versus a one-off trial. And then, and then, so about like a science of building talent, you can't really do that on YouTube, actually. Um, you can do it on the newer platforms. Like, um, like for example, I've, I've actually invested in a few companies that specialize in doing this. And you can you build up a pretty strong profile on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Vine, you know, within six months, you know, a couple hundred thousand followers, like ridiculous reach. So there's a science. And, and you're saying there's a science off of YouTube. It's YouTube's too hard. It's too cluttered. Yeah. And, and, and I would say that a lot of the bigger names, they were early adopters to the platform, which is something everybody misses. I mean, there are some that, of course, can come in and just boom, but they, they are very, very rare. Um, so, I mean, the, what to look at? You know, I have a guy that is now making content for Oculus Rift because he wants to be one of the first people making content on that platform. So you just can't discount the early adopters to the platform. Are you seeing those sort of people on messaging services? Are they starting to use WeChat or or, or uh, Tango or WhatsApp or anything as a vehicle for for pushing their creation? Uh, they're gonna. There's gonna be a big push for Weibo, WeChat, all the China platforms. Like you have actually a lot of these China portals. So like Yoku, which is pretty much a YouTube of China, they're coming out here to like pretty much recruit all the top talent. Yeah, I would disagree though I'd, with the fact that there is no science to YouTube. I, I think there still exists a, a science and a formula. You look at collaborations, you look at just best practices. They're there for sure, but you definitely need some help. Like it's, it's definitely a lot more cluttered. It's getting very expensive to engage the bigger creators. And I think they realize the power that they have to grow someone else's audience. And people are a lot more skeptical and cautious with it now, but the, the the formula was there. It's just it's become a little more challenging to execute it. Now. And then and then also the top talent. You want to get somebody where Adam was talking about that can cross platforms. And again, that's even more rare. You know, a Bethany or a Grace Helbig that can you know for America's Funniest Home Videos, we actually even we're replacing Tom Bergeron. He's he's leaving actually retiring. Wait, we, Tom Bergeron's retiring. He is, yes. Oh my God, you ruined my week. <laughs> well, from America's Funniest Home Videos, he's still doing Dancing Which, with by the, the way, Stars. America's Funniest Home Videos is like season twenty three. Yeah, right? it was twenty five. Longest running show ever. Crazy. <laughs> but we he did the we first actually, crazy morning talk show out of New York City in a loft on Fox oh, right. Two. They were in an apartment loft and they walked through. Yeah, I remember. It was actually a cool show. How do you remember? I'm much older than I was. I was, was going to so. say, <laughs> Oil of Olay. I don't know. About it. Um, but he, we actually auditioned some YouTube talent for to host the show, the broadcast show, and it did not, not all of them cross over, you know, some, some worked and some didn't. And it's really interesting to see what happens when you take them off the platform. Uh, mega talent agencies, mega talent combining. I mean, where's the coalescing, coalescing power force in all of this? 
you know, we know where it is in traditional Hollywood, right? You want to get a $200 million movie made. There's six guys, six studios that can make it for you. Where's that kind of power concentration? Audience, whoever can like so take no their CAA audience to... of this space. Well, the, the reality for a talent agency, and yes, they all do have their play towards digital, is that the dollars are still smaller than they're seeing on the film and television side. So it's how do you take the digital specific talent and figure out revenue generating opportunities? Some people have proved like UTA have proven success on the publishing side. Okay, let's say that only a small percentage of their existing audience converts to purchases on their book on Amazon. Well, that's 25,000 copies. 25,000 copies is a New York Times bestseller. Um, so there is an approach, but is there really a value add when it comes to brand and sponsorship opportunities on digital? That's yet to be seen. Your, your question was, there's about a hundred. So for us as a buying agent, there's about a hundred MCNs. So we mentioned 400,000 influencers. It's hard to reach out to those. Is there a network or ad network I can get to, you know, full screens, great resource, collective makers, machinima, big, fr I mean, there, there's just, there's a ton, there's a hundred of them. So, and then from there, then there's just dealing with, you go to Social Blade, right? Fleet platform. You can go ahead and look at all the ranking of all the influencers out there for any genre. I think the top genre right now for influencers is food. You know, I do a lot in gaming, but uh, so there's all rankings within that area. So those are free tools. There's so many tools out there right now. Tony mentioned a few of them that are just about discovering from a top layer, but there's so much work to do to get through that engagement cycle to figure out what's best for the brand and what kind of program and content you have. And that's probably the last note, which is the thing they're struggling with the most or the challenge we have most is creativity. They're not just a, a media outlet that says, here, take this and let, you know, give you two week runtime, let me know when you're done. They're actually really starving for creative ideation. How do I engage my audience? What makes you know, it's exhausting for these guys to have to post every week, sometimes five times a week. So how do you keep it fresh and engaging? So that is a, another, unknown commodity if you just don't put it in their hands and magic will happen there's just there's so many layers to the management it just it can make your head spin i want to see the diva show youtube divas if one of you could get to work on that for uh, me. there's about six of those in development right now <laughs> come on here because they're they're telecasting it to, <coughs> so we can hear you i'm not sure how far this is gonna go is that about it is that about as far as it goes you can take my uh on cbs <laughs> Is there anybody watching CBS still? Oh, oh come on. Go ahead. Um, I have Go a question on. about lifestyle programming. What do you see um, the future of programming? Obviously, like we have Michelle Phan, that's the breakout video star for uh, beauty, and now she has a deal with Endemol. But what areas of growth do you see from a content perspective? Because obviously, not everyone can just be a host and talk about games. Or, but there, I see what's popular on YouTube where you have experts in certain categories and they don't have to look like movie stars or whatever, but, but they're valued for the information that they provide. Um, I'm just curious what you see the growth potential for and what's the best format. Is it five minute content, 10 minute along those lines? Yeah, two great questions there for sure. You mentioned food, Chris, I think topics. Yeah, I think in general, the lifestyle category has huge opportunity. So, a lot of girls started in fashion and beauty, and now that's expanding to home decor, DIY, food, um, and there's a real need for it, not just purely based on search, where you could get super niche and how to tie a bow tie. There's probably two videos that are at the top of that search that have been sitting there for five years and are not necessarily the most quality of content, but they've surfaced because of uh, SEO. And then with newer content and starting up today, I would say consistency, finding the niche and, and what you're able to, to do on a, a regular basis. So, you know, there are very few food creators. Um, our, our friend at Ken Beth at Lemanic has a channel called Entertaining with Beth that she started up over the last year and a half, but because she was appealing to an older female demographic, there was a need for it and it's grown over time. I think it's just under 200,000 subscribers, which, you know, still room for growth, but it didn't exist a year ago. By the way, is that mid tier 200,000 if you had to tier them? Um, Ish? I would call low that emerging. Yeah. Emerging. Is that below low? <laughs> No, it's just broken out of low. Okay, cool. That's a, so that's an interesting metric, 200,000 subscribers. How many views does that? Uh, I would have to look on her. I would say we, we look on, on average, average for emerging talent, we would consider um, 100,000 views 
per Subscribe. video. So we look at the most recent six videos on average view count. Although to note, YouTube's algorithm actually watches watch time, not view count. So how much of each video are you watching and are you staying on the platform? Um, we have a girl named Tara Michelle, who's a student at FITM. She's now averaging 100,000 views per video. She only has 350,000 subscribers. So that's a great a great ratio and and you know she's growing so rapidly that she's probably one of our top quote unquote emerging talent right now i'm sorry her topic is she's fashion beauty lifestyle never enough of those things other top you guys out there hello <laughs> okay oh you kind know, of make everybody laugh a little bit a lot up. come on you're in la <laughs> so 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 the the new programming a lot of it's going to be very cpm driven actually so like you talk about lifestyle, et cetera, those have like 20, $30 CPMs, right? You talk about like gaming content, you can barely sell it, right? Cause it's not brand safe, et cetera. Um, there's only so many buyers. Um, yeah. There's, there, there's a, um, to her question specifically. So it's, there's a blue ocean right now out there of what's going on with content creation. So your, your quest, first two questions, two part one was, what is, where are things trending and where are things going? There's 45 categories tracked on YouTube of different content made. There's another 100 yet to be done. It's really wide open. That's really exciting. I think for this conference, and it's a renaissance right now within content creation, there's more studios. There's a reason there's a, this place is called Silicon Beach right now. There's a reason these people are up in this panel. And the funding that's going on is absolutely insane. So the, the risk taking for three guys to go make short form content and going, you know, that's how Freddie Wong began. And so, you know, he, yeah, he aspires to be a major feature film director, but he's doing five minute content in, in format content. So it's awesome. That's awesome. What a great time to be a creator. What a great time to be working there for brands. They're trying to figure this out and they're, yeah, I'm sitting up here from a luxury position, right? I'm working on Halo and I don't know what, you know, we're doing a podcast called for hunt the truth. That's 11 minute episode that's trending number one on, 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 um, I, um, podcasting right now. It's, you never would have thought that 500,000 people are listening to weekly episodics on a companion narrative that has nothing to do with, with the core canon of, of Halo, but influencers and brand creators can be along the story. You don't have to be the originator of the story. So there is so many great things to be doing that just start doing it. Just well, start doing also, it. Also, I would say, think about where the audience is going. So the younger generation that is now growing up with YouTube is transitioning into young mothers, wives, et cetera. So something like uh, our friend Sarah Panna launching Awestruck, which will focus on older females. And by older, I mean, it's 25 plus, but traditionally YouTube has been <laughs> 13 to 18, but that audience is growing and there's a need for it. And especially from the brand side, because there's so few and far between successes in the, the motherhood category that the few that are um, proving success as far as audience engagement and consistent content, they're getting those brand deals at a higher premium value because it's such a small pool of, of uh, creators offering it. Other trending top. I want to make sure we come back to formats too, which Sean asked about. Well, I would say um, we're always going to, the categories that pop for us are always going to be through the filter of our own businesses, right? So for me right now, I have my eye on 80s, 90s nostalgia because it's huge. If you look at, uh, there was a great viral video, Too Many Cooks that was trending for a while. It's sort of like, 80s and 90s you know focused stuff almost eating itself you know and you just it's getting you know spun back out in this way that's very creative and fun and kitschy and weird and you know really great so of course with the assets that i have i have my eye on that so if i really think a, a key point would be sure look at what categories are popping but what category fits best for you and what you're doing I think it, it also speaks to the, the creator starving for creativity and having a tough time with the creative. Uh, everyone's looking for a way to keep their audience engaged. And then part of it is just uh, collaborating within the community and seeing who wants to do something. And from there, different formats are spinning out every day. Uh, we're tracking them just to see where, where this is moving and, and where you want to try to capitalize on it. If you look at the world of gaming, let's play, uh, walkthroughs, unboxings, these weren't in my vocabulary five years ago. And now it's something that advertisers are calling us up trying to figure out how they can be a part of it. And, and the brands can be the source of creativity as well. If you look at, I mean, 
one of my favorites was it happened about a year and a half ago, I think, where the slow mo guys went to GE and they just got basically a playroom to play with different machines, right? So GE loves that. Slow mo guys love that. Now they have some new videos that they can make. And then there's a strategy on how you distribute those videos. So two of those videos go up on the GE uh, YouTube channel. And then one of those videos go up on the Slow Mo Guys channel, which is probably going to get a lot more views. Uh, so a ton of people watch that video and then you point it towards the GE channel. So it's sort of a win-win. The Slow Mo Guys love it uh, and the GE loves it. And that's not even the coolest brand. I mean, that's not like a Nike or a, a right. GoPro or well, a really cool brand doing it with you. Well, and that's the thing about lifestyle is it's like at that genre in particular, that vertical, there's a lot of brands that can really make awesome experiences for the people who are making videos. Um, they just have to be creative about how they do it. Were they blowing stuff up? <laughs> they were doing like, uh, they have these machines that vibrate very quickly and I liked it. It was great. Um, I think another interesting thing that you're going to see from the brand perspective is we were encouraging from full screens and I know a lot of the, the networks are doing this as well, encouraging brands to become content creators on their own and to do so the way that some of these big YouTube celebrities have really done so by establishing a community, producing content on a consistent basis that's not just going to be short form or long form commercials but content that's actually going to engage their consumer base and see where that starts to develop. And I think as this strategy continues to get embraced by a lot of these major brands, like some of the most creative ones, which I would argue GE is one of our more creative partners that we work with. I just said they weren't a cool brand. <laughs> they are probably one of the coolest brands too. <laughs> and when you look at some of the things that they're doing in this content space, it's incredible. But when you start getting these creative powerhouses like Nike jumping into the mix and really starting to make content in the, in the form of a, of a creator and not just as a brand, I think that's gonna become really interesting. Ripple, BMW. They're already doing it. Marriott. Format, so format. Uh, yeah, I've been reading a lot about that. Format, Marriott, he said. Um, three minute, five minute, 10 minute, shorter is better than longer. I think it varies. You seem to be calling out for some interactivity, which would be a step into the future. It'll vary. I mean, we talk about hygiene content and hero content where the hygiene content is uh, bite-sized snackable content that you want to be able to just go in check out quickly on a consistent basis and then the hero content is going to be that big viral piece that you really want to just show all your friends and post it on facebook etc i mean the goal is retention so how much of that video are they watching if you can justify putting up a 22 minute video and there's a reason for the audience to stay through the entirety, then sure. But for the most part, I think it still averages around five to seven minutes for, for my talent at least. Um, with the occasional, you know, ranting QA that goes 15 minutes plus, as long as that 60% plus retention is there, then it, it's justified. 60 plus at three to five minutes? Um, YouTube's algorithm considered 60% watch time above average because they know that tail end of the video may have an end card that drags on or you know the person may become redundant and just talk towards the end of their outro whereas the real meat of the the video is in the uh, top and, and middle section i think though when you think about format like we were talking about discoverability and youtube being saturated i mean the rules if you're a creator you just, I don't know if you, you should really re take them seriously, honestly, if you're from the creator standpoint, if you're managing a number of creators, then you can think about rules. If you're making a video for a brand, but if you're a creator and you want to figure out how to stick out, you need to be original. You need to have a voice. And so when it comes to length of video and things like that, I mean, you just make something and you see what sticks, I think. Totally. A lot of, I mean, I have to say this panel's got, you guys, it wasn't like you were organized together, you know, or you're just disparate people and you've had a lot of the same themes. A lot of stick to your to your heart theme. It's going to be difficult for certain parents who would prefer their kids to go to college, but uh, uh, I'm going to just take somebody else if you don't mind. Come, come out here, sir, so we can all hear you. Okay, great. We'll come back to you. So you should get a second question for being first. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question of Kadua. You, you talked about advertising. Uh, advertisers uh, being a whole series of new advertisers as well as new creators. Do you talk a little bit about 
the new advertisers that are in this space? As far as new brands that are coming into the space, I think uh, one thing that you see is a lot of startups that are are trying to find ways for creators to really help grow their brand uh, as quickly as possible and make as much of an impact as possible. But you also see traditional companies that are that have been around for decades that are now trying to figure out a way to to really increase the longevity of their brand. I think when I first joined full screen, one of the most interesting ones that I came across was AARP. Uh, AARP got into just decided they were going to jump in quickly and aggressively and learn as they go within the content space. And they took a lot of risks uh, as far as the type of content that they were producing. We produced a great series for uh, George Takei, I believe with, you, with, with us, guys too. yeah. Uh, so, and that was great. And it was, it was a great way for them to learn what their audience was looking for within the space. And since then we've continued to work with them to, to grow that. But then even GE, which we've been talking about extensively, doesn't feel like a traditional uh, brand that you would expect to produce this really cool content. But I, I think the team over at GE really understands the power of this audience. And it's not so much about trying to sell a product through a video. They want everyone to understand that GE is powering the world around you and you're, it's going to stick and resonate in the minds of this 13 to 34 consumer that's living within this platform. I mean, how many 13 year olds are learning about GE at school? I'd, I'd be surprised to see how many of them are learning, especially since no one can recursive anymore, apparently. So, uh, really defeats the ability for them to read their logo. Yeah, we're, we're losing cursive in the curriculum, unfortunately. Uh, but we're doing so in a way because you, you know, it's, it's inescapable where, where people are spending their time right now. So the brands realize it, uh, everyone's moving their power numbers. Uh, Who's an advertiser you'd love to get? That I would love to get. Yeah, if you were running a sponsorship or selling ads to for full screen or we're working with producers. a lot of them. Uh, I think just throw out a few. Well, I'm you know, ask what? everybody to throw out a few. We'd we'd love to. It's different between how I guess it varies with how you're working with them. I think people like GoPro and Red Bull are incredible companies to work with, but they're also very much in control of their creative, and so for them, it's more about. Uh, distributing content for them versus producing content with them. And I think when you let uh, a major creator pair up with a brand like that, uh, that would get us excited. But I can give a good example of um, a brand evolving their thinking. So our client, Gigi Gorgeous, is the first ever transgender national spokesperson for P&G. It's through Crest 3D White Whitening in Canada. Um, she's a fashion and beauty blogger on YouTube with 1.3 plus million subscribers. And the fact that uh, Procter & Gamble can evolve their thinking to recognize the highly engaged audience that she speaks to, she actually replaced Shakira in the campaign in store and in advertorial. So I think that's a good example. Any other brands anybody you want to mention? I think uh, you in the corner, sir, had a question. And when you say Google, you mean YouTube. Okay. Uh, evolution of MCN and uh, and uh, um, what are the potential YouTube threats to various parts of your business? I mean, from our world, we've evolved from uh, what was traditional, like the traditional sense of an MCN is just uh, a network that's aggregating channels and then helping them monetize themselves better, grow audiences, and ultimately connect them with brands. Uh, we're still doing a lot of that. The, as we evolve, we're, we're really becoming more about just empowering content creators to produce content that they want to create. When we talk about the starving for creativity, uh, it's not so much starving for creativity, but uh, you have an audience that you have an incredible amount of pressure to program to on a weekly basis. What we've really tried doing is, is giving these creators the resources and the abilities to connect with one another to collaborate with one another, find like-minded creators within this massive network that we've amassed of over 65,000 content creators, but also uh, bringing them in and, and putting them with Emmy award-winning writers, producers, directors, 
that we've brought on to the staff to produce content that will probably work for all sorts of platforms. It could go, it can cross over to traditional, uh, it can cross over to the podcasts or on demand. So it's, it's helping identify where those creators are, who they are, who has the ability to move over and then really empowering them and, and growing them, uh, giving them the resources that they could use. As far as the threats from uh, YouTube, I don't necessarily, I don't think any of us really look at it as a threat so much. Uh, I think we, we all look at, we need YouTube to continue helping surface the creators and, and really supporting them. You talk about the Google preferred partnerships and driving down sunset and seeing these creators all, all over the billboards. Most of those creators are in the full screen network in makers network. Uh, you know, we, that's just giving them added visibility and exposure so that when we're going out and we're speaking with our brand partners, uh, it's a face that they actually recognize. I think that MCN model has definitely changed over the last two years, even the last year. Um, but at the end of the day, the fact is they're going to have a more direct conversation with an advertiser than an individual creator or even YouTube itself because they're hyper-targeting their campaigns. Um, so that's really the value add for the talent. And then uh, as far as threats from Google, I would say that Google is actually should be more concerned about outside threats. So mm -hmm. with, with distribution to other platforms, full screen, for instance, making an OTT play, Vessel coming out strong with heavy marketing soon and, and big, big investment dollars. I think that that's forcing Google to uh, reinvest in its, its top creators and its content in general and refine their, their platform and their product to better suit the talent. So even little things like uh, making music libraries available, making the creator studio, studio available for iOS, mobile app, like things like that, that's them, their way of supporting the creators. And we'll hear a lot more of that soon. There's a, there's a thing we're dealing with right now at our agency, which is around the concept of the speed of conversation that is happening with brands and with content creators. So the move with Twitch being acquired by Amazon and as you all know, YouTube was trying to make a significant play on that. I think the the live streaming, the ability to interact with brands and relationships simultaneously or instantaneously is a big deal. So uh, how those platforms merge and evolve is going to be part of that shift. Um, from our perspective as an agency, I mean, every day I'm shocked, but it's incredible the valuations these companies have and they're getting acquired at. So someone's doing some calculation, no one called us on that, but how they're feeling brands are spending money with them, but it is astronomical. So there is something going on there within the MCN stack. And that's probably the biggest thing with the MCNs is the technology that's powering behind that. I think there's the aggregated relationships, but that's a tough one because these guys are all really kind of independent, but working there, it's the technology and it's the service. It's hard for the talent to be discovered as well as it is for the content to be discovered. So these guys also offer a valuable service there within certain times and that's always evolving and shifting. But um, I think for us, the thing we're looking at the, the most right now is the live streaming aspect of relationships of content, how that flows. You bullish on Periscope and Meerkat? Uh, we are bullish on any platform that engages uh, the brand with, with an audience for sure. Yeah. And even more live streaming, I hear you saying. Yeah, live streaming has become uh, probably the big, the little trick of the trade we're using right now with, with YouTube is, um, and if, I don't know if anyone here goes to VidCon, but you all should go to VidCon if this is a big deal it's for you. It's a special guys. experience. But um, we'll do, uh, since it's hard for these exclusive events or events to take place, we'll do a lot of simulcasting. So we'll take 20, 30 key talent uh, to actually simulcast a press release or an event yeah. or any type of element. And so it's you borrowing their audience for uh, an hour, for 30 minutes, just to simulcast the event live stream within their audience. YouTube's platform allows that feature to happen. It's a really great way of using that talent and the channels I'm sure would be happy to do as well to help expand the reach of any one moment you're doing. So uh, simulcast is another area that we're trying to tinkle with. We've been doing a lot of within, within the talent bed to, uh, to try to reach their audience in different ways. Go ahead. Yeah, so MCNs, just add what Chris was saying too, is um, they're all kind of morphing and uh, focusing on a specific business. If you like dove down into like what an MCN actually is or what it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be a data company, technology company, production company, talent company, et cetera, et cetera. So now every MCN specializing in something from OTT to like production, 
and also like how you know YouTube is, you know, from a threat standpoint of view, it's not really a threat. I think it's actually an complete evolution of how advertisers and how brands are looking at things. So we started off as an ad tech company and we're now getting into the branded content business, which is like, you don't really think of ad tech as branded content, but like, because advertisers are so focused on, you know, content marketing, activations, et cetera, you know, it's becoming, uh, it's morphing businesses. I was going to ask you if you wanted to have a question on ad tech based on the background of your company, but, uh, but apparently you're not limiting yourself to ad tech anymore. Any cool ad tech you've seen out there, particularly in terms of either delivering or, or analyzing or even tech inside the ad itself that uh, yeah. is worth mentioning? I would say like for ad tech, the most interesting is data aggregation and being able to figure out audience segments. As I said, YouTube doesn't allow you to have like your, your audience data that you, you know, spent most of your money through. And by the way, like YouTube spending is like less than 10% of anyone's digital buy or the whole industry. So 90 plus percent is spent elsewhere and that data isn't utilized on YouTube. So the, the innovations are around like the data connectivity, et cetera. That's yeah. video ad spend. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. I'm talking about just like all digital. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because like, higher percentage cause, cause YouTube has like in banner, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Like that's not video, you know? So it's right. Yeah, yeah, we did say, I think it's less, uh, when you do all the aggregate spend of the Fortune 500, it's less than, it's less than 10%. It's like mm -hmm. 1% with an influencer stack we're talking about today, but yet it's 99% of the conversation. So it's, it's very interesting, the dynamics of how much time is spent versus the return on that time in terms of investment. Other, uh, okay, right here in the, yes, you right here. Uh, I had a question in terms of television content creators that have shown that uh, on network on cable that cutting down segments to go on YouTube, what do you find is, you know, when you're talking about branding and promotion and marketing, what do you find resonates with that community and what do you want to do to grow those views? Well, I could say that I think uh, there are really good examples of that out there, specifically Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon. It's almost as if they're producing the TV version of the show with those segments and vignettes in mind to be repurposed for, for YouTube. And I'm sure America's Funniest Videos has some good examples as well. But you actually see Jimmy Fallon, Conan doing original pieces for YouTube so that they're engaging the audience direct on that platform. They both have really good channel trailers, which are specific to YouTube. They're, they're not just pulled from the show. So it's a, it's a balance of repurposing from the network air, but then also doing original that specifically engages on YouTube using the YouTube platform and following the trends and the conversation. So if there is something that is, is trending, is it worth getting involved in? I mean, the ice bucket challenge is a terrible example at this point, but jumping on that bandwagon early on and, and being a part of that um, conversation and engagement probably would benefit you because then, you know, that's the platform it's taking place on, not on, on television. By the way, I believe this was true in the beginning. I haven't double checked it. So if somebody knows, you can set me straight. But I believe Fallon's ratings are still higher than, than Leno's. And that in fact, with all this pushing out the content in other platforms, the TV ratings themselves are still higher. And I'm sure within the 18 to 24 demo. Now there is one. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a big difference than four years ago. Yes, Chris. Yeah, I, I, you know, to her question around television and shows, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Rebecca has comments on this too, but so we manage Yahoo right now for community. So community is season eight, seven, where they abandoned from their current platform. Yahoo picked it up. Marissa decided she wants to do original content creation, television form, 30 minute episodic, 24 minute episodic, either A, holistically sponsored by one brand or B, drive traffic to help keep Yahoo's platform a platform people spend more time on than anyone else's or C, do you do subscriber based? So you're asking about business modeling, the modeling for Yahoo and the other, they have what, uh, Sin City, uh, um, uh, they have a series of contests that are coming out within the Yahoo side, way different than Amazon strategy, right? Which is sub uh, then Netflix, then the television that you mentioned in terms of traditional format. So, uh, and then the length of format, <laughs> it, it, you're dealing with X, Y, and Z. So it is, um, 
but the amount of it out there is incredible. It's the discovery of it, I think, is more of the challenge than maybe tinkering with the data analytics of is 18 better than 16. Um, you still have to have great writers and great creative and then find those audiences. And there's a lot of ways to get those audiences. But um, your question is a good one, but it's the one I think everybody has here. No one's figured it out. Um, but a lot of CMOs are all going across the board on this, this business modeling for sure. Do you see Netflix or Hulu getting into the short form prosumer category of video or? We, we know YouTube's getting into longer and longer format. We know that. Again, I think it all goes back to their business modeling and what pr produces revenue that's meaningful for them or not. Yeah, I think when you talk about cutting down TV content, one advice that we always give our network partners and brand partners is whatever you're doing, do it for the audience, not for your brand. Uh, a big mistake that studio partners, TV partners, networks, cable tend to make is cutting up a piece of content that they think is going to make the person in the room next door really excited to see. Uh, knowing that all your money went into producing this 30 minute series or whatever it might be, you want to see another equally splashy piece of content, a sizzle that you can s circulate around the office, but your YouTube community where you're probably most likely pushing that content out within your YouTube channel is going to have a very different audience most likely. And so make sure that you're, programming to that audience, the way that you would be on television, uh, understand who your audience is over there and what content they're looking for. Yeah, I feel like I have to jump in on this one. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think taking the show cut down and then just slapping it across any platform is, is a bad idea. And I think a lot of television shows do it because they're like, well, we spent so much money on this and let's just put it here and it'll do well. I think 100% if you can get your writers to bake it into the show itself and to think of digital when they're in the actual creative process, that's, that's monumental. That's something we're working on now. Um, for us, uh, another point that was hit upon is reacting to trends, stuff that you would never think of America's Funniest Home Videos doing, we now do. Like we look at Reddit every single day. Matthew McConaughey's video up there trending to where he was watching Star Wars, the new Star Wars, right? We just cut it into babies reacting to Star Wars, <laughs> which is very on brand for us and went super viral. And you end up just hijacking that trend and also doing something that's very organic to you, but it's something our show would never really do, but it, it works as the perfect sort of parallel partnership. So I think you have to look, it really is kind of a language, learning a language, but you really have to look for that I, you know, for example, we're not a narrative show, right? Our show is really about the clips. We, you, we don't really have a star. I mean, we have our host, but the clips are the star, right? If you have more of a narrative show, then you have to kind of work with those characters. I think Duck Dynasty does that really well. I think Walking Dead does that really well, where they actually let their fans react to something that's happening within the narrative. So it's really very show dependent. Other TV related comments? Uh, you know, I promised this, there was, there was somebody right behind you. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay, and then, then we'll come to you. Well, hopefully we'll get over here to you. I'm sorry, start over for me. I... As far as the narrative content goes, how does that play out in the short form development? Like, what do you find better? And then, uh, the you have an example of both, like, have you seen out there? Like, when you're, like, so... We may have drawn a distinction here that is hard to speak Wait, to. What was the actual question? I, 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 I'm not 100% sure, but I, I, there were three well, comparisons and I only got two. Let's start with that. Well, I think like you see with the evolution of content on any platform, you sort of cast a wide net and then start to narrow it in on specific um, formats and, and categories. Scripted in particular, there's very few and far between proven successes on, on YouTube. But as of right now, there's a lot of that in development being produced. I'm sure this week at, at New Fronts and next week, you're going to be hearing a lot of scripted announcements in addition to continued um, 
unscripted and, and other uh, docu formatted series, but doesn't mean it won't happen down the road. I think it just hasn't been proven specific to the YouTube platform yet. Narrative versus uh, traditional UGC, any particular comments? I mean, there's a Hollywood audience to some extent, so I think there's this now, I hear it all the time here in LA, which is kind of like, what happens to, I mean, is this a writer's world or a producer's well, world? I mean, or? you said it earlier that one of the great things about YouTube is, and digital in general, using it as an incubator. So, you know, shows like Broad City came out of digital and now are, net, are cable network shows like Comedy Central. And you're seeing a lot more of that because you have the freedom to test the waters on digital. Just whenever anyone asks me how to get started, I say, just pick up a camera and go start, get your friends together. But it's a, it's a your phone. Pick up your phone. <laughs> I think it's a it's a personality world. I mean, that's the truth. It's not a writer's world. It's not a director's world. It's a personality medium. You know, like personalities on the internet will drive stuff. And Broad City is a good example of something that was on the web and works great on TV. Um, but on the web, you need to have huge stars, people who can just draw eyeballs. People love. I think it varies. We're gonna we will be seeing a lot more scripted in the near future. Uh, a lot of our creators are coming in with a desire to start experimenting with scripted and see where it goes and try their hand at acting. And we're working with them. A lot of brands are getting into it as well. We're uh, rolling out a scripted series with Sour Patch Kids with several of the biggest YouTubers out there right now. So uh, we'll see what plays out best. Yeah, we'll see. I, I think the problem though is um the try your hand at acting part, which is like, <laughs> like good, good luck. I mean, there's, there's very talented people on YouTube and some of them are actors, that's great, but acting is hard to do and it's hard to make a really good show. And so this idea that you can take YouTube talent and put them in a narrative show and be like, now it's your turn to act. It's just, it's, it's, it's I mean, good, good luck. Uh, we'll see. And I think some shows will definitely work. And then people will say, see there, it does work. But I think the my guess is that over the next few years, we're going to see a lot of pretty bad shows actually um, because of that acting. For sure. But I also think they said the same thing with musicians, right? And we, we went through that with Justin Bieber. We were talking about it with Sean Mendez. Um, not to say that I, I'm a huge Bieber fan, but, uh, you know, to each their own, but it's a discovery platform. So it's, it's going to, individuals are going to discover their own talents as well. Right. Absolutely. Very interesting. Uh, yes, I said you next. Super loud if you're at least stand up. Oprah doesn't have to work with this limitation. I hear one of the big advantages of YouTube is the power of the community that has been held by the top content creators that have grown this channel for seven years. But I don't know many individual YouTube community members, people who are subscribed to the channel, connecting back and forth between the accounts. It's a Google Plus debacle. Like, is there really a niche community still growing within YouTube, or is it more beneficial to start on a you know, smaller network where it's not so difficult to have your content see the light of day? I'll, I'll let me chime in first on that one. So you don't think of it as so linear as just YouTube. It'd be like you just saying you're just watching ABC or something like that. It's it's their platform and the the ta from a talent perspective, they're omnipresent. They are constantly they're on the new platforms before you realize whether it's Instagram or Snapchat or Vine or Periscope. So you have to look at the re the relationship of that ecosystem. So when someone has two hundred thousand subscribers and then you're trying to determine and look at the comments, looking at the engagement, you also have to look at that influencer and in what other platforms he or she or that group is engaging on and you'll actually find quite interesting maybe those off platforms twitter or facebook have even higher followers or engagements that companion that a lot of the driving they do to their shows is because they're posting you know, my next show is up right on on twitter or other types of platforms so look at that overall ecosystem of how they look there are a ton of listening tools a ton radiant six uh hootsuite ccmos tools that you can go to and listen. And so that's the hardest thing to do in our business is listen <laughs> and trying to figure out then what bubbles up to make great creative. So for us, most of our creative ideation doesn't come from the brand marketing or the creative team. It comes from the audience. So we'll, we'll bubble up top 10 things that are being talked about 
and listening to that. And then we'll retool the creative brief for influencers that way. This is the brief provided by the audience that has their opinion on the brand. Then the brand dictating what they think the audience wants to hear. It's a total opposite in those areas. Does that kind of help answer, Lynn? I'm sure you guys have. YouTube versus niche, more niche uh, distributors. Well, I was just going to say that um, there's two two sides to it. The YouTube algorithm actually rewards you for using the YouTube platform. So if you're a YouTube channel, a top YouTuber, and you're not actually in there engaging, commenting, liking, subscribing, watching other people's channels, then that's going to uh, show in the algorithm. In front of the the scenes with talent, the people that are the best at what they do are because they understand it. I mean, they're in there, they know the tools, they know the product, they know the audience, they know the other content. And from that, they build um, their own their own content. So even in some cases now, you know, with someone like our client, My Life is Ava, she has a lot of copycat videos because people are literally taking what she does and replicating it. And I'm not talking about people with five subscribers, I'm talking about people with hundreds of subscribers because they see and recognize the success of her videos so they're literally just replicating it to achieve that same success so when you're big you have to have a team working the social media for you not just yourself well actually our our talent and yeah in some instances we support them with editorial teams but for the most part they're they're the ones using the platforms they know their brand best they're the ones that will best speak to to their content their audience and their offering you know, I think um, I think it's a great question. I think the way YouTube started versus where it is now is important to keep in mind when thinking about commenting and, and interactivity, because I think in the beginning it was this incredible interaction between a creator and fans. And now if you look at a lot of YouTube comments, it's just kind of like a cesspool in a lot of ways. And when you have like PewDiePie, one of the biggest YouTubers, turning off his YouTube comments and interacting with his fans solely on Twitter. I mean, I think it's something that's just, it's, it's just, it's a great question and worth, worth keeping note of. So I think anybody that makes it now has to be able to interact with their fans on and off the platform. Now I'm going to ask each of you for kind of a prediction, you know, something, you know, really futuristic about YouTube and or the broader digital video space. If you prefer super short, I'm going to take one question first, but then I'm going to come back to you guys for kind of your, your 12 month prediction. And I promise somebody right over here, I believe. Go ahead. Here, why don't you take the microphone since there is one here? You actually are close to the microphone. Uh, thank you guys so much. This has been a great panel. And I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to some of the strategies for pilot incubation that has come up. Is YouTube the right platform for that given the discovery challenges? Does Facebook video fit in there somewhere? And just sort of what should people be doing that they're not doing right now? You might have just answered your own question. I think there's a big opportunity right now in Facebook video. Um, it may not be the trendiest platform out there, but the eyeballs sit on Facebook. It's, it's like email at this point. Everyone has it and has it open at some point during the day. And it is more of an open playing field when it comes to video. So whoever comes in and does that right will we'll, uh, see the benefit. Yeah, and I, th I think you have to think of YouTube or Vimeo you know, as the player, and then you have to cross promote on these other platforms and, and definitely don't count out Facebook because it is huge and mom share like crazy. Now they, that is their own player though, correct? Also? Yeah. On Facebook, it's a native player. So you would, that you know, you would re upload your video in essence to get the most reach out of it, but just. Or they've just, also built in tools uh, for call to action. So you could tease basically a, a shortened promo version of your YouTube video and then push direct to YouTube with the call to action button at the end of the video, which that's significant. It's Facebook saying, okay, we'll play nice. We'll send traffic back to YouTube as long as you are also posting original here. If you just embedded the YouTube version on Facebook, the Facebook algorithm wouldn't reward that. Right. And you can also now embed Facebook videos, which is interesting as well. So they're becoming a big player. Frenemies, frenemies, frenemies. <laughs> Things have not changed that much over the 15 or 20 years of the internet. Uh, okay. Predictions. Give us a big, short prediction. Big, short prediction? <laughs> uh, we'll see. I think in the next 12 months, uh, it'll be a very interesting time. YouTube will launch a subscription service, and that'll probably lead to the discovery of some very talented uh, content creators who are producing content that we haven't seen before. And 
uh, you'll see an entirely new wave of consumers starting to flock to the platform. Uh, you know, yeah. less of a prediction, I think more of a keep your eye on, keep your eye on, you know, Periscope, Meerkat, Riff, um, Snapchat, they're all going to do some very interesting things. And some of the biggest creators are going to come out of those platforms. Um, so the last couple of years, China websites have been copying YouTube. I think the next couple of years, YouTube is going to copy China sites. Okay. Uh, I would just say traditional ad dollars and business continuing to shift towards digital, whether it's on the advertiser side or even entertainment industry as far as studio, television networks, et cetera, looking for their big digital play. And then really this year more than ever being the, the year of talent, and I'm not just saying that as a talent manager, but focusing on individuals, their successes, and what that can look like on and off YouTube. Uh... Nice question, Mike. Uh, I don't know the. Uh, I'm not really necessarily. Second to last. Come on. I'm not really a prognosticator, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more live streaming taking place in terms of relationship. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yesterday I was watching ESPN, and it had an actual eSport uh, Heroes of the Dorm going for uh, Blizzard's title, first ever on ESPN, full live stream experience out there on the gaming side, but. Um, Broadcast it now on the channel of ESPN, so it reverse engineered that way. So that was ESPN uh, one, the main ESPN, uh, ESPN two ESPN going there, two. but that was, that was pretty cool anyway. So live stream. Um, going back to shows, I think that if we after twelve months, if we look at the shows that came out this year that involved YouTubers. I think the shows that will be successful are the ones that partnered with the creators and really put them in a position to succeed, whether they're actors or musicians or have their own style of content the the show creators who were able to leverage what they do really well and put them in position to succeed i think those shows will be great and i'm going with 10 billion dollars in advertising by the end of 2016 in the u.s on digital video advertising thanks everybody you were really great thanks yeah you too i'm excited about all the china to view uh uh, next stop, right? Thank you so much. How do you take right. a YouTube talent for drinks? <laughs> you specifically? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know that. I know that. Sure, but I mean, who doesn't want a free drink? <laughs>